Okay, well, I think we're going to start. It sounds like there will be a lot of people joining us a little late, uh, given that the last session did end a little late, but we have a lot to cover today, so I think we're going to go ahead and get started, let people file in. Um, my name is Joyce Bittinger. I'm a patient advocate that specializes in metastatic breast cancer and specifically in lobular breast cancer. And the first thing I want to do is I want to thank each and every one of you for being here. It's a very exciting day for those of us in lobular breast cancer. Um, so welcome to the people here in the audience and welcome to our live stream people. Um, the, I'm going to make some very short remarks to give us time, but I wanted to talk just a little bit about changes in the landscape for lobular breast cancer. Um, like many of you who are probably in the audience and watching, I was diagnosed quite some time ago, 2010, and when I got my diagnosis, they told me I, that lobular breast cancer was just breast cancer, that it was in the lobules and not the ducts. And I went, okay. And um, my breast cancer was missed for four years in a high-risk clinic because I wasn't giving an MRI. And um, of course, I didn't know that um, lobular often doesn't show up on mammograms. I didn't know to ask for an MRI. Um, so um, I got treatment, got put on a hormone blocker, and then in 2014, um, I started having a lot of pain in my stomach. And uh, my scans were clear, my markers were all in the normal range, so we assumed I had something like GERD or something like that, and I started taking that. And when those medications didn't work, um, I got an endoscopy to show that my stomach was full of cancer. Um, I'm sharing this not so that you care about what happened to me, but because I know so many of you have the same story, and it's indicative of where we've been um, so very recently. So when this happened to me, and I had this like singular cell kind of um, thing in my stomach I knew nothing about, so I got on the internet and tried to find everything, and I contacted someone very prominent in the breast cancer world, and I said, I have this weird thing. Who's the guy? Who do I go to? And she goes, I don't know, give me a couple days. Came back to me and said, there's no guy. Nobody was focusing on this. And while that may not be true, um, at the time in 2014, there was just no information, um, no information at all. So I started trying to get information and uh, started a, a closed Facebook group for folks with metastatic lobular disease. So in that time, uh, we've come a long way. We have a lot of ways to go, but we've come a long way. Um, one of our speakers today is Steffi Oosterreich, not bad, um, who uh, was the chair of the first international, the first scientific meeting specifically devoted to lobular breast cancer, and it was phenomenal. I just, like for a first meeting for anything, just wonderful sessions collected wonderful researchers, clinicians, and advocates. Um, we're going to be having another one in 2018. Um, and we now have the Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance forming. And I want to tip my hat to Lee Pate, who's taken over um, my job in uh, this um, seminar because I've had some health issues. But she's been a driving force for this alliance so that now um, when people get diagnosed, they have a place to go for information early on, and what happened to me, and probably what happened to a lot of you sitting here, doesn't happen to happen to, to anyone else who gets diagnosed. And that's, that's a true passion of mine. And so what I want you to know is that I know a lot of you who I don't know, but our speakers and our planners have had a huge impact in changing the landscape of lobular breast disease. And I'm so grateful. And again, thank you all for being here. And thank you to Lee Pate, who I'm now going to introduce, who um, I can't possibly tell you all the wonderful things about her, but know that she's making a huge difference for all of us. Thank you. Hello, um, I am Lee Pate, and I'm so pleased to introduce our speakers today for, um, to learn more about lobular breast cancer. I want to welcome everybody who's here also for our live stream. Um, and I also, as a reminder, a little disclaimer here, um, is that just remember that for our questions, these are not designed to respond to individual questions um, and our providers on stage. We're going to take questions that are more of a general nature and also understand with these breakout sessions that while the information that you learn is um, 
based on the most scientific uh, evidence that you really need to take the information you learn and go home and make sure you're informing uh, your questions to your doctors and work with your doctors for your treatment. Um, so I'm really, really pleased to introduce uh, two speakers today, Dr. Steffi Usterich, who is a professor at McGee Women's Research Institute at the University of Pittsburgh. She is a Coleman Scholar. Uh, and her primary of interest, area of interest is endocrine resistance in breast cancer with a focus on lobular breast cancer. She is co-chair of the first international uh, symposium on lobular breast cancer, and I know several, several of us in the room were here there for that, which was extremely exciting. And um, uh, she also is a recipient of an award for the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network for a grant to study genetic and epigenetic changes uh, in metastatic sites, unusual metastatic sites of ILC, particularly the GI tract and the ovaries. And then where she's going to be followed by Dr. Hannah Linden, who is a clinician at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance and professor at University of Washington School of Medicine and a full member of the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. Um, she has ex a lot of experience in treating lobular metastasis. Uh, and she is currently leading a Seattle arm of an early stage clinical trial um, that is going to study endocrine response for women with ILC. So, welcome to Steffi. Thanks, Lee. So, good morning, everybody. You can hear me well? Yes. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, so thanks uh, to Lee and everybody else really for inviting me here. Uh, I want to give you just a brief background how uh, I get into researching lobular breast cancer. So my lab has been studying hormone response really for many years. Uh, and approximately six or seven years ago when we studied the estrogen receptor in more detail, which is a target for endocrine therapy, we came across some genes. And when I looked, when I tried to figure out where they are expressed, uh, I found that they are expressed in invasive lobular breast cancer cell lines. And at that point, I said, wow, I don't really know what that is. And I found out that uh, there's very little published, or there was very little published, on hormone action specifically in lobular breast cancer. It surprised me because just looking at a cell, at an ILC, an invasive lobular breast cancer cell, it looked so different, and the estrogen receptor activity was so different. So at that point in time, we decided to study this in more detail. And Lee mentioned very briefly that last year, we uh, got together approximately 130 uh, scientists, physicians, uh, breast cancer patients, and advocates from all over the world, really, who focus on ILC, and we had a great meeting back in Pittsburgh, and I think it really was successful because as a result of this, we have many more collaborations studying ILC where people get together asking the same question with the same goal. So I think it really spurred a lot of uh, research in the area. I think another result is that we thought it was so important and so critical that this meeting now happens every two years. So the next uh, time it will happen next year in Boston, and then you know it will happen 2020 again. So I think that uh, will be great and will always be super important for people to collaborate and exchange ideas. And last but not least, uh, Lee mentioned already that um, um, uh, that there is now this uh, lobular breast cancer advocacy group, LBCA, where some of you in the room are heavily involved, and, and I have to be, uh, I'm very fortunate to have uh, worked with Lee and others on this over the, last, uh, over the last year, and that has been great. So I'm going to give you a brief background, uh, you know, breast and ILC 101, the fundamentals on invasive lobular breast cancer in this session. We, uh, well, I'm trying to focus just on basics. Uh, in the second session, I will again speak and I'll focus more on specific aspects of metastasis in patients in ILC. Uh, 
as I'm a PhD and not an MD, I will really focus on the uh, research aspects of this, what we are doing in the lab, what's known and what we want to figure out. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'll start. Let me see if I have a pointer. Do I have a pointer? Anybody? Um, so, something about the frequency of uh, lobular breast cancer. The frequency of lobular breast cancer uh, is approximately 10 to 15 percent of all breast cancer. And however, because breast cancer in general is such a frequent dis disease, uh, only 10 to 15 percent basically adds up to more than 30,000 women a year. So if you take, if you, if you separate ILC and IDC, great, thank you. If you separate IDC and ILC, you can see that ILC actually ranks as the sixth most common uh, cancer in women. Uh, this is highlighted here. Uh, the number of ILC cases are uh, comparable to those of brain tumors and multiple myeloma. However, nevertheless, it remains an understudied disease. Just briefly, what does it look like? And that's shown here. So uh, ductal cancer cells, uh, IDC is a more frequent, 75 to 80 per cells. All the, all the uh, cells attach each other, whereas an ILC, and you can see this here, the cells grow more as lines, which is uh, part of the reason why it's more, more difficult to see on imaging. Standard uh, molecular uh, characteristics of ILC are loss of Ekaterin. I'll come back to this uh, later on. They are mostly estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, and HER2 negative. They grow pretty slow. The marker KI67 uh, is most of the time relatively low, and they grow in these long sheets of cells. In addition, not every ILC is the same. There are actually subtypes within ILC, and this is studied pretty heavily by the pathologist. Alveolar, solid, pleomorphic, pleomorphic, signet red, mucinous, and mixed. So there are a couple of uh, subtypes of ILC, which we really molecularly know very, very little about. Uh, on this slide, you can see, or I try to summarize in one slide, results from really the largest molecular study of uh, ILC samples. This was done as part of a uh, large in initiative called TCGA, or the Cancer Genome Atlas, which completely characterized, or very comprehensively, I should say, 127 ILCs. So these are a couple of methods which were used. They were compared to IDCs. And uh, like I said, this was the largest study. And what was the result is first, that the main criteria, which is really found in more than 95% of ILCs, is that these tumors do not, do not have functional ekaterin. And I'm going to show you on the next slide uh, what this means. In addition to this, we found that the rates of, in general, the rates of luminal A, so tumors which have more ER, more PR, and lower K KI67 are lower than an IDC. And then we found some changes in range of mutations, and this is shown here. There are genes which uh, regulate the estrogen receptor. I'm not going into detail, I just saw those names out there. They're called FOXA1 and GARA3. The mutation rates in those genes are very different as compared to tumors of ductal nature. And the second thing is that P10, a gene which is critical in another uh, pathway where we now have drugs for, in a pathway called PI3 kinase in AKT, is also differentially altered in lobular tumors as compared to ductal. So this again, this is a larger study. It clearly showed that first, ekaterin is the hallmark of lobular cancer, and second, it showed that there are genomic differences. We knew for the last decade, or longer than a decade, like multiple decades, that the pathologists, they look at it, and the disease is clearly different. But now, I think this study showed that there are molecular differences as well. Uh, 
what is Ekaterin? Um, try to show this on the slide. So these are two cells adjacent to each other, and Ekaterin is a protein which goes to the cell membrane of these two adjacent cells, and it makes the cell stick to each other. Like I showed you on the previous slide, more than 95% of ILC tumors don't have that protein, which means the cells don't stick to each other. They are, that's why they grow in these lines as compared to, these, uh, to the lump in the breast. This is uh, just some staining we did on cells in the lab. So these are breast cancer cells, and these are actually ductal breast cancer cells. We can stain them for ekaterin, that's shown here. And this is just the DNA, so you can just see some counter staining. So each red uh, line here basically is a circumference of a, of a cell. Uh, when we take out ekaterin, we can do this in the lab with approaches called siRNA. You can see the red color disappeared. And in addition, you can see that these more cuboid uh, patterns now turn into smaller round cells looking much more like an ILC cell. So we can do that and we can then look in the lab what, uh, how do the cells change in growth and metastasis and other features. There are more and more groups uh, studying lobular tumors. We are not the only one. There are groups within the US and in Europe and uh, as well. And this is a summary of the number of lobular tumors which have been genetically characterized over the last two or three years. So these are different groups uh, within the US and within Europe. These are the number of estrogen receptor positive tumors where people looked at the DNA or at the RNA and comprehensively characterized that. I could talk about this, this is my passion. I could talk about this for the next 10 hours but I will not expose you, I will just have one slide. Uh, so one of the very, very important and somewhat surprising finding was from these studies is that HER2 and HER3, and you heard about this this morning earlier, is much more frequently mutated in lobular tumors than we had anticipated. I showed you in the beginning slide that in general the dogma is ILCs are ER positive, PR positive, very low HER2 expression. But what the studies show is that there's a substantial fraction of lobular tumors, and very often not in the primary breast, but throughout progression when they start to metastasize, that they actually gain mutations in HER2 and HER3. And some of the clinicians, and I think Hannah, Dr. Linden can talk more about this later on, uh, now trying to figure out are those patients potentially are candidates for her two targeted therapies. This was very exciting, and I have to say that doing uh, detailed studies, we can find that the frequency of her two and her three mutation correlates very significantly with mutations of this gene CDH1, which is ekaterin. So her two and her three mutations are more frequent in lobular tumors than in ductal tumors. Though this is clearly something we need to understand more. We don't understand the biology, why that is, and it potentially has clinical uh, relevance. And then the last slide I'm going to share with you is this one. The other thing what came out from those studies, and again, I want to connect this to the studies you heard this morning, is that there might be a subset of uh, of patients, and again, this is very, very early, and we have lots of, lots of research to, uh, to do that might be eligible, actually, for immune therapy. And the reason I'm saying this is that in the two largest studies, one called TCGA and one called RASA Consortium from Europe, so one is from the US, one is from Europe, they did this comprehensive genomic characterization. The, one of the findings which was most consistent between those two studies, in addition to the loss of ekaterin, was that there are a subset of tumors which both groups um, uh, called immune-related. And you can see this here. You don't need to worry about all the red and green and blue, but there's basically, these are the ILC samples they characterize in both of those studies. And you can see that in both studies, they identify a substantial um, part of these tumors which had very high expression of immune genes. 
So we don't know what that means, but it is clearly very exciting and we need to study that in more detail. So I want to end with some other very uh, brief comments on other features of ILC, which I think we absolutely need to study and we do not understand. Uh, the disease is clearly exquisitely hormone responsive. Um, the percent of uh, cells within a tumor and the percent of tumors which are ER positive are, is much higher than an IDC. And the second, from epidemiological studies, and many of them are actually done here in Seattle, it is also shown that uh, the risk after exposure to hormone for ILC is higher than IDC. Activation of PI3 kinase, AKT, and loss of P10 is more frequent in ductal cancer. This fascinates me, and we really have done very little of this. In ILC, in contrast to IDC, almost every cell is not surrounded by another tumor cell, but it's surrounded by something we call stroma. So these are other cells. These could be, you know, fat cells, uh, fibroblasts, immune cell, blood cells, whatever. But because of the way they grow, the environment of the tumor cell is very different. And we don't understand, uh, we understand very little about this. And finally, last but not least, uh, we have some evidence in the lab that the metabolism of, uh, the metabolism of the cells, for example, the way the cell uses uh, sugar or fat is very different in lobular cancer cells as compared to ductal cancer cells. These are very early studies. And, you know, it might have, in the long run, it might have something to do, again, with changes in imaging. But we don't know. It's too early to say. And, you know, we clearly need more and better models. When we started this research six or seven years ago, we realized there are just hardly any models because, again, it's only 10 or 15 percent. What we have been focusing on over the last 20 or so years is making saline models and making uh, animal models for ductal cancer. So I think we clearly need more models to be able to study this. And uh, you know what I'm going to talk a little bit in the afternoon is these unique aspects of metastatic dissemination, like Joyce said earlier, to the GI tract, to the ovary. Uh, we need to study this. Uh, we know very little about this. So I would like to thank everybody. I would clearly like to thank my lab. A lot of it is done in collaboration with Dr. Adrian Lee, who is adjacent uh, to my lab in the Women's Cancer Research Center in Pittsburgh. We have many great collaborators. You can never do this on your own. You need, actually, you need to interact with other uh, uh, scientists and physicians to really figure these out, to really make meaningful progress. The patients who donated tissue for our work and clearly the funding agency. And I would like to highlight uh, PCRF, Komen, and the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network, to, uh, who are fundamental in supporting our research on ILC. And this is it. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, so the thing's up there. That's okay. I'm cool. This is for what? And this, this and is the point. Ah, you go. Oh, and really you good. Go okay. All right. Well, thanks for having me here. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I, VK kind of, you know, stole the thunder and told you about my research, which is great because I'm not going to talk about it right now. Um, but uh, I, am, uh, I am an ER expert because we do that kind of research, and so I'm a lobular expert because lobulars are ER positive. Um, so, you know, lobular tumors, I think that I'm really trying to not repeat, but I think that the theme is they spread like a net. So they don't spread like a round clump of things. They spread in a much more stealth fashion, like a net, and that is why they're more difficult to find by imaging. They also can cover a lot more ground, you know, kind of like a spider web. Uh, they can reach out uh, farther than the imaging might see. So even though it might be detected by imaging, when you actually go to resect the tumor, it's a little bigger, it has some tentacles, and you get a positive margin, and you got to go back and get the rest of it. The other little fact about lobular tumors, for whatever reason, is you're more likely to have bilateral tumors. So when you uh, get diagnosed with a lobular tumor, we, we ought to look harder at the other breast to make sure we're not missing something. And that other something could be ductal. 
Okay, so it's just one of those weird little facts that I don't think we can explain yet. Um, they are generally more slow growing. So, you know, the person who had breast cancer and then frankly forgot they had breast cancer decade goes by and they show up with something in their bone or something elsewhere, that's often a lobular tumor, the late indolent tumor. And they are much more often estrogen receptor and progesterone receptor positive. And, you know, one of the studies that's come out of really our region is the Women's Health Initiative. Um, you know, in the old days, everybody got hormone replacement therapy. We gave it out as health food when I was a resident. When I was a resident, if you had a heart attack, we sent you home on, on hormone replacement therapy because we thought that was going to prevent you from having a heart attack. We don't think that anymore, but um, it's actually the lobular tumors that seem to be associated with the hormone replacement therapy. So. Um, one of the things that I say to people when I diagnose them with their estrogen receptor positive tumors, you can't ever take that, ever. Not even some natural progesterone cream that might, like, you think have a really nice impact on your skin. Try something else because it can fuel the tumor. Okay, so this is, um, you know, I should have asked my kids for help with the cartoon, but this is my attempt at a cartoon. Um, and this is the difference between lobular and ductal. Okay, ductal is a little clump of cells, lobular is a net. Okay, and what's weird about the net thing is, you know, we're a little bit like a worm, you know, we have a mouth and a rear end and a lot of tubing between us, and that net can come around it. And that was what I was trying to draw in the middle there is the net constricting something. So I've met people whose esophagus was being constricted by that net. I've met people whose stomach was being constricted by that net. Oddly, I've met people whose ureters were being restricted by that net. And the really tricky part of it is, you could have a scope that goes down the top of that tube and you're looking at the inside and the net's on the outside. So the scope could, the endoscopy or, or the cystoscopy could look normal and you still have it. So it's a sneaky type of thing that can show up in, in odd places and sometimes you have to look extra hard to find it. I guess this could be kind of crazy making because you're gonna think that you know every time you have a little tummy cramp, you know, this could be, this could be the cancer and you have to sort of work through that because basically if it's there, it's there. It's not going to come and go. But this is the, the odd f sequence of events that leads to metastases in, 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 that the metastases can cause in lobulars and they're, they're, they're very uh, different than ductals. Ductals would be a mass of cells that, that just bumps into something. Okay, so they are much more challenging to stage, but the treatment, you know, as best we know, is based on just, you know, your estrogen receptor, progesterone, and HER2. But I think, as Steffi alluded to, that can change. So if you're living with your cancer for many, many years, and it starts acting differently, that may be a reason to get a mother biopsy to see if the estrogen receptor or the progesterone receptor or the HER2 has changed. And each of those things would, would probably make us scratch our heads a little bit and change your treatment. And I've certainly seen people... Uh, you know, start with a pleomorphic HER2 positive, go to a more garden variety, wimpy HER2 negative, and even become ER negative. You can see lobulars that do that, and they can do it over time. I don't think you need a biopsy every other month, but every several years, it's not unreasonable to ask the question, and the reason you want to ask the question is our treatments really keep getting better. So we have molecularly targeted agents that seem to really hit some of the endocrine resistance features, and we have three brands of CK4-6 inhibitors. We have one PI3 kinase inhibitor pathway, Everolimus. These are all FDA-approved drugs. Abemacyclob isn't quite FDA-approved, but it will be in a few minutes. And um, these are all active in breast cancer, and I think there's something to really think about using if what you've got is a, a, a cancer that's basically chemo-resistant, but, uh, but may still be estrogen-sensitive. Sen just ER-directed therapy in and of itself has really evolved recently, and you know we have a, the aromatase inhibitors are more potent drugs than what we had before. Fulvestrant is a very active drug, but I always feel like it's a little punitive because it's a shot. And we have some oral, oral agents that are selective estrogen receptor down regulators like fulvestrant that are in development, which I think ultimately will replace it. So in terms of, um, you know, questions to ask. Um, these are the ones that I think about is, you know, sort of where is it? How are you going to follow it? Uh, do you, is there a tumor marker? What are we going to use? 
what is the more recent status of the biopsy? I mean, some people get so frustrated trying to make a biopsy diagnosis in a patient that they give up. And they just say, well, they're bone meds. You had breast cancer. It's going to be, it's just going to be what you had. I don't want to torture anybody with multiple biopsies, but I think making a good histologic diagnosis is really a standard of care. Um, but on the other hand, who wants to go through the process over and over again? So you have to make a decision about that. The other thing is sometimes um, people think they have lobular, and actually they don't. They have a mixed ductal lobular, lobular and we, we sort of say that the ductal overdrives that. Um, and then, you know, is there a clinical trial? We've, we've got an oral CERD in development, and you could be a candidate for that trial. Um, and then I think the other question I was getting at is just if you have some odd symptoms, you know, should we look harder? And the other place I failed to mention earlier was behind the eye. You know, we are we come shrink wrapped. Each uh, e each organ in our body has a little lining, and the breast cancer, the lobular cells like that lining. So you have to sort of think about it. And what's odd about that is, you know, your eye is a part of your central nervous system, so. That's technically a brain met, but it's not. It's really on the outside of your brain, and it's the outside of your eye. And uh, we do have treatments for that. So, um, you know, the, the places that we tend to see it, it can, you know, around the lining of the GI tract, around the lining of the lungs, around the lining of the heart, unfortunately, which is not a good place for it. And then the retroperitoneum is really your back, which is where the, over, which is where the ureters hang out, the tubes that go from your kidney to your bladder. And then... Your perineal cavity is really, you know, your belly, and that's often where we see this tumor. And we actually often see what are called drop metastases to the ovary. And, you know, we don't necessarily know why, but I have a really good idea. Your ovary is where the estrogen is. So, so it's trophic to those cells. And so if you're kind of perimenopausal, your ovary still has a little estrogen, so it's feeding it, so the cells want to hang out there. And um, there can be a reason for the ovary to come out. I, I, most people with an ovarian mass and breast cancer have metastatic breast cancer. That's the majority. But I, I've diagnosed a couple curable ovarian cancers that way. So I tend to be one to recommend we take that out, um, but uh, just because I want to know what we're dealing with. Um, but it's not wrong to watch it. And you know, when we have ER imaging, we'll be able to follow that, but that's not ready for prime time yet. OK, so I think it's a chance to go to questions. Think about that lining. <sighs> Thank you. very frequently is about imaging. And what is the best imaging? And this would be for Dr. Linden uh, yes, that you I, recommend I definitely for am, I am known as an imaging expert because of the estrogen receptor stuff we do. But there isn't a perfect imaging. That's the whole problem. Uh, there, there, isn't a, there isn't a perfect imaging tool. It depends on what situation you're in. So um, one of the reasons we're developing estrogen receptor imaging is that will be a really useful tool because it will show you where it is and it will show you whether the estrogen receptor is functional. So, you know, that's really promising. But um, we have a first-line trial through a cooperative group, and that is accruing now, and, uh, um, uh, but we don't have an answer for that. So in terms of imaging, um, you know, the, as um, Joyce alluded to, uh, Lobulars can be found more often by MRI than by, uh, by traditional Im imaging, and so a high-risk protocol involves getting a, an MRI in part to find that lobular tumor. It's not 100%. Nothing ever is, unfortunately. Um, so I think when you're thinking about imaging, sometimes if you have a persistent sy sym symptom, you just have to decide how, how hard you want to push it. And the reason I you know, drew that little thing with the tubes and the squeezing is you may need to get to a situation where you can take a picture of what's going on and not just is there caking, is there something in that lining, but is there a stricture, is there something kinking that tube. So for some problems, you know, if your kidney function is changing, you're going to need a urologist and a scope to figure it out. 
so they can see the, the shape of that. But the other truth that we have to be, realize is that as the cells sort of coalesce, even though they're still in a net, they've created a mat with those cells that, that Dr. Osterich was, was describing to you. And so you can see that thickening. So you can see that the omental surface, which is the, the lining of your intestines, is thickened. And you can see that come and go, and you can follow that. So just because imaging isn't as good doesn't mean it's useless. Um, but uh, this is a tough question because it's not as if I can tell you there's some really new promising imaging tool that's going to solve the problem. Okay. Um, we have a question about uh, um, is when lobular breast cancer does um, spread, is an endoscopy helpful as a diagnosis? Yeah, it can, it can be, but what's scary to me is it, there could be a miss because if it's on the outside, you're not gonna find it. And so sometimes you need, you need to sort of go at it more aggressively. And of course, you, know, you don't wanna perforate anything, your colon or your stomach, that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. But you probably need sometimes multiple biopsies to, to find things. But endoscopy you know, is a lighted tube, but it's inside that, that it's not on the outside, and that's where this whole thing gets kind of frustrating. So if you really needed to know, sometimes you would have to, you know, have a laparoscopic procedure where you look in and look around and know and under, you know, you're under anesthesia for that, and then you're picking and choosing where you see the abnormalities. Thank you. Uh, one more scan question. If a PET scan shows, this is from our live stream, but if a PET scan shows no evidence of disease, then um, how is a biopsy determined? Yeah, so you can't, you, you know, the point of the imaging is to guide where you're going to put that needle. So if the PET scan shows no evidence of disease, you're kind of stuck going with it. Now, let's say you have bone-dominant cancer, because that's the most common thing. You could go to an old site and biopsy it and see if it's active. You might find a mix of, of sort of sleeping cells and active cells, but, you know, you don't just have the one scan. When the radiologist reads your scan, they're not, I really hope they're not just reading today's scan. You know, they gotta look at years of scans for you and sort of see where those old sites are and, and pull it together. But if the PET scan shows no evidence of disease, I think your chance of, uh, of a yield on a biopsy is pretty low. This is for um, Dr. Oosterreich. Is the HER2, HER3 mutations are accompanied by, are they accompanied by HER2 amplifications? Um, and if not, how do we test for those mutations to treat uh, with her two meds? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, I remember then we had this meeting uh, last year. Somebody asked the same question, and the numbers are pretty small for us to make solid conclusions at this point in time. I think we have seen samples where we have mutations without amplifications, and we also have seen a few with, uh, mutations with amplifications. So I think we need to clearly sequence many more tumors to answer the study. Uh, this question, I'll come back a little bit to this uh, later on in my, in my presentations in the afternoon. Yeah, and HER2, even though um, you know, it's a CLIA certified fancy test that's been vetted by many, many societies, it's a vexing test for us, and there's a gray zone in there of, uh, of, of intermediate. And um, this is a hard one because you know, we all want to give the targeted therapy. HER2-directed therapy is one of our most satisfying treatments. You know, it really works really well, and I've certainly seen it work in lobular tumors that are HER2-positive. But you don't want to waste somebody's time uh, either uh, and, and expose them to potential side effects if they don't have the right thing. So you know, we generally just go with the amplification. There are uh, certain types of mutations that we're now, you know, are now good indications. And that, that test, even though it seems like it's the same thing, IHC and FISH, that test keeps getting better, and we keep talking about this because everybody wants to find that patient who's going to benefit. Um, and we're almost out of time, but... Um one of the things that many of us with ILC know that is when we have little breast cancer and big pre breast cancer world, um, many of us want to, especially if you're being treated in smaller communities, um, 
what advice would you all give for patients who might be newly diagnosed and where to go uh, and what they might do for uh, treatment for lobular. people who have more experience with treating lobular disease? Yeah, that's hard. I mean, healthcare is regional, really, for, for everything. And so, you know, if you have some rare sarcoma, you know, you're not going to get treated at your community hospital in a rural environment because that surgeon has really never operated on that. Lobular is a little more common than that, um, but uh, you know it's not it's not wrong to come somewhere else for an opinion. You know to come to a bigger city with a you know university and a medical center and people who do research and you know fancier tools to to try to ask some questions. But that being said, you know people with lobular breast cancer have participated in every major breast cancer trial. I mean they're not excluded. So. The data that we find to guide treatment for people does include lobular tumors. So I, I am, I, you know, I, I think this issue of, you know, whether or not you have to go back for a re-excision for that lumpectomy, you know, maybe maybe at a better center that, that has more experience with it, we're going to save you that. But I think people have been getting really good care everywhere for this, and certainly these the new drugs we have, the palbociclib and the everolimus, that's available everywhere. That's approved by every insurer. I do think there's a problem in a rural area where they don't, people don't appreciate that you can, you can take endocrine therapy for your tumor, you can then need chemotherapy, and then you can go back to the endocrine therapy. I think that is something that gets overlooked, it, not in a place like Seattle, but in, in a place that, that, that with less experience just with breast cancer in general. Okay. And then, Steffi, uh, one question is what would you see as for molecular for the research that you're doing, what do you see as might be some of the more promising outcomes that could be um, coming in the near future or far future? <laughs> I think um, what we really would like to focus on is improving prediction to uh, response to endocrine therapy. Mm -hmm. I think given that more than 90% of ILCs express a lot of estrogen receptor, I think really trying to figure out the best endocrine therapy should be a major focus of research. Uh, actually, at our institution, together with like eight or nine other institutions, Seattle here being one of them, uh, we are currently doing a trial. It's a window trial where patients get, receive uh, three different endocrine therapies uh, be, uh, before surgery is scheduled. So it's only for three weeks, but we have a biopsy before the endocrine therapy, and then we get a biopsy at surgery. And trying to figure out uh, genetically, so understanding the tumor before and after three weeks of these three different endocrine therapies, which is tamoxifen, aromatase, aromatase inhibitor, and an assert, like full restraint, uh, to see can I predict, based on the genetic makeup of the tumor, to which endocrine therapy the tumor responds best. I think that should be a, a focus uh, for us, just because that is the majority of, uh, of tumors, of ILCs. You know, thinking of better imaging, using estrogen as a ligand to, to see where these tumors uh, spread to and do that early. Uh, I think growth factor receptors, so growth factor receptors are these receptors on the membrane of cells which bind ligand, like HER2 being one of them, but there are others like IGF receptor, FGF receptor, for whatever reason, and we don't really understand that, they seem to be very active in ILCs. So we started to study this, and there are quite a few drugs out there. There are good drugs out there. The drugs didn't make it forward very often in clinical trials because the clinical trials had both uh, patients with IDC and patients with ILC. The trials are powered so you put enough patients on it to see a difference for the whole patient population. They are not powered, there are not enough patients with ILC in these trials that you actually, if there's a signal, if there's a response, you would never see that because it's only 10%. So I think the idea of really having trials where you enrich for patients with ILC, I think that's super critical. So for the physicians to rethink clinical trial design, I think is very, very important. And then I think finally to really understand why these tumors go to all sites of metastasis, like you know, 
the linings of uh, various um, parts like the eye or the ovary or the uterus. I think, why is it? Uh, maybe in part it's hormone, but it's not everything given the majority of women uh, are postmenopausal, right? It's not just estrogen, it's something else. So I think trying to get models where you can study that, and most important, I think, trying to get tissue where you can actually look what happens in the tissue, what changes are there. I think that is uh, critical for us to make progress. So one other way you can figure out how to benefit patients with lobular tumors is for the, to take a group of trials and then go back and pull out the lobular subset. And I actually asked the, the uh, people who make the palpociclib for that question recently, and they sent me a nice little summary. Uh, and basically, if you look at Paloma 1, 2, and 3, the lobular patients got even more benefit, which is not surprising because they're the ER positive patients, those strongly ER positive patients. But that is, you know, I agree that we need slots so that we can really tell each individual what is likely to happen for them. But one other way we have of, of doing this is going back to the big pile of data, taking out a segment and telling you what's meaningful in that segment. And you can sort of add some trials together, although the statisticians would be queasy about this because they're not exactly the same. But I do think also, and I don't, I'm not saying this just to jump on the bandwagon, but I do think the understanding of this one-third of tumors, which have this very high expression of this immune signature, oh, yeah. to really think if there's a, it's not everybody, clearly, but there is a subset uh, which clearly is characterized by uh, infiltration of immune cells, maybe by specific genetic changes, like it was mentioned this, earlier this morning, this microsatellite instability. I think to identify that and model that, understand that, again, we need tumors. We need to look in tumor tissue and count the immune cell, which immune cells are there, and not only how many, but where are they within the tumor. And again, given that these lobular tumors are so different, where these grow in these spider webs, where there's very different cell-cell interaction. Your neighbor is not another tumor cells, like in the ductal tumor, but your neighbor is something else. Chances are it's a fat cells or it's an immune cell or a blood vessel or something. Right, so it's the, the microenvironment. It's the, tissue, it's the micro, tissue microenvironment, and, and you, could, you could make a case that the tissue microenvironment is where that immune infiltrate is going to yeah. come from. And so it's, it's just really important that we, we try to look at that interface. So um, we're going to have to uh, uh, wrap up, and it's about time to head to lunch. I, you know, there were a ton of really terrific questions. I'm hoping that some of these questions will be answered um, during uh, Lobular 102, which is coming back for everybody on live stream. It's coming back at 1 o'clock on the same channel. Um, and in, uh, for... Uh, um, and then that topic of that is going to be lobular 102, and we're going to do a deeper dive into metastasis and the clinical and hopefully leave a lot more time for Q&A and get into some of these clinical questions. Um, if you have not found it, you should try to check out lobularbreastcancer.org. It's a brand new website, and we've tried to, is the landing page still? You can sign up. Um, to learn about the launch, and you can uh, get some good information to download um, as, as it becomes available. And this is a website of a newly forming Lobular Breast Cancer Alliance, and it's meant to be a good basic resource um, for patients. For everybody here in the room, um, we're in, having a dinner tonight. It's a no-host dinner, but if you have Lobular, you're a friend of Lobular, you're a caretaker of Lobular, you'd like to join us, come see Marilyn. Um, and we're having a casual, this is a casual dinner at a pizza place about three blocks away, and it's a wonderful, it's just an opportunity to get to meet each other and talk and um, actually put some faces to some more lobular, some lobular folks here or here. So we hope you can join that. Um, yes, and if you want to see Elizabeth, we have some cards with a website on it. Um, and... Uh, um, 
The other, this, uh, the other thing I would say, and as part of this, is for uh, metastatic patients, uh, particularly in, with this um, National Metastatic Network uh, grant that um, Steffi is doing, but we are um, uh, one of the opportunities to help promote research is to uh, make sure that you've signed up for the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project and that your samples um, that, that we're able to get tumor samples in and, and having enough ILC tumor samples that are in tumor research is extremely important to learn more about disease. So see Corey Painter in the Metastatic Breast Cancer Project if you want more information about that, and she's here as well. Um, so thank you very much. I appreciate your time. We'll see you at 1 o'clock. See you soon.